unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today we're going to take our reading from the Gospel of Mark, the 11th chapter and the 24th verse. The Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, this is Jesus, okay? He says, Whatsoever ye desire, whatsoever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Whatsoever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Whatsoever things, whatever you desire, whatever thing you desire. It says believe that you receive it or receive them and you shall have them. These are some of the most complicated scriptures for a big number of Christians. Yet, they're supposed to be simple. God amazes me in how he sent his word. All right? God did not send his word according to where we were at individually. All right? But he sent his word holistically, with a big picture from the beginning to the end, author and finisher of all these things, he gave us the full picture of whatever it is and available for us in the Word. And then he left it to us individually to design, or by the help of our teachers, preachers, our pastors, evangelists, prophets, and apostles, to help us and equip us with the right tools to be able uh, to discern what God is saying to the end that we might all walk into what is truly revealed in us. So two people can read the same verse, Mark eleven twenty four. 24, so whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And one man is believing God for a pair of shoes, $50, all right? And Somehow a door opens for that man, and as he has asked God, he gets the $50, and then he buys the shoe. And that's a testimony. Okay, It's a testimony. But there's a man who, on the same scripture, is going to ask for a million dollars. All right? And that man will believe God, and it shall be given to him. And there's a man on the same scripture who's going to ask for a trillion dollars. And God will not hold back from that man because he has believed God. All right? Now, the challenge we have in the body of Christ touching the spirit of religion is it will not have a problem with answered prayer. But it has a problem when the prayer goes beyond human expectation. That's where our people in religion have a problem. The spirit of religion has a problem. Okay. It submits men to prayers that are realistic, that are time bound, that are attainable, that make sense in the reasonings of men. And so the faith of people who are under a religious spirit can only function on something that is predictable or can be explainable considering the available resources, the available provisions, the possible ways in which a thing can come. You see, even the world predicts their life on the same pattern and principle. And so you have heard, or some of you will hear, or I have had an opportunity to hear, people who are against, you know, big answers, who are against great miracles, who are against things that are beyond human scrutiny. They have a challenge when God answers prayers beyond the usual, all right? Beyond the usual. 
One time I was watching a small little clip and there's this preacher who was attacking another preacher. And this problem with the preacher he was attacking was how can you tell people that they can have everything they ask? Like God is, you know, some sort of person that is just out there dishing to men everything they ask. How can you say that God gives everything that you want? What if people don't receive it? What if they don't receive the things they've asked for? And they're going to get disappointed and leave the faith? What if they don't believe? What if they don't believe? Even the Bible asks, what if they don't believe? Does that mean that God is unfaithful? What if the man asks for something? Well, if you have asked or prayed for someone and you don't receive it, does that mean that God is unfaithful? No. The Bible says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? No. He abides faithful. In spite of whether it has worked for you or if it doesn't, there's a man on the same surface of the earth who reads the same Bible, believes in the same God, and has worked for. And yet God has told you he's no respecter of persons. But it is how one man sees things and how another sees and how you see things. All right? Tonight, I want to provoke you. To ask so big, that even the chair you're seated on starts to shake, that even the house you're in starts to tremble, that the things around you start to rumble in confusion because of your prayer. Tonight I want to, you know, elevate your spirit into the God dream, the dream God has about you. I want to open many scriptures as I will to share with you just how to walk in the fullness of God, to walk in the fullness to understand that there is a point in God where your desires can be met. He says, whatsoever things ye desire. Whatsoever things ye desire. The only challenge that we have with our people in the religious, you know, understanding of things. When I'm talking about religious, I'm not just talking about one group of people who believe, you know, a certain way. No, 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 no. There are Pentecostals, born-again Pentecostals, who are more religious and many people in religious affiliations. Because religion is a spirit. It's not just the thing you affiliate to, it's a spirit. And in the days of our Lord and Savior Jesus, you'll see that he always had a problem with religious people. In fact, many of them, he never even used to negotiate. He used to tell them, war unto you, Pharisees, war unto you, war unto you. He used very harsh words, as though the Lord did not love them. Yes, he did. But Jesus had a problem with the spirit of religion. He hated the spirit of religion like I do. Because it leaves out the weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of faith. The weightier matters of mercy. When you're under the spirit of religion, you cannot function fully in faith. You always have limitations. Your faith always has boundaries. Why? Because you see, when you are under the spirit of religion, you are under the law. And the law is always in the qualification of the self. The law is always in the qualification of the self. It always looks to the attaining of the man and his abilities, in his own strength, in his own wisdom, and everything that he has, resources, name it. When we're talking about grace, we're talking about things you're not able to do, things you're not able to attain. Things God will do through you and people will clearly say, this was only God and not that man. This was only God and not that woman. But you need to understand how things work. Because every time people look at such truths, like I just read in Mark, whatsoever things you desire, it disturbs their brain that God can actually give a believer whatsoever he desires. Of course, that has not been the reality of many people. But that doesn't mean that it changes the word of God. They mean that because it has not worked for you. God is wrong to put Mark eleven twenty four 24 in scripture. Judge him. Don't judge the men who are simply preaching the God of the Bible. It's the Bible. It's the word of God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You just need to know how this works. Okay? Because, for example, there are many people who read Mark eleven twenty four, 24. And imagine that everyone is carnal. That when we say whatsoever things you desire, they will ask for the carnal. I know why people think that way. Because the Bible says, to the unbelieving and defiled, nothing is pure. Nothing is pure. But all things are pure. All things are pure to them that believe. 
But it says, but to the unbelieving and defiled, nothing is pure. Even their conscience and mind is defiled. So the war really is how we realign our minds, our conscience, our heart to God. So we understand how to connect to God enough to allow him work all the desires through us, over us, for us, by us, to manifestation. If any man is separate from God or independent from God, if that man desires, that man will desire wickedness. He will desire out of an evil heart. Those are people who don't know God. And we have Christians, okay, who have not yet well been acquainted with God. That when you define desire, they still have a lust in their souls. They have a lust in their flesh that sometimes seeks to connect to this desire and even ask for things that are outside the boundaries of the liberties or freedoms that we have in the spirit. And I always tell people that as you mature in the wisdom of God, you realize that there are boundaries in our liberties. But those boundaries in our liberties are not there to say that you can only stretch this far in God's abundance. No, but they're there to say you can only stretch as far, okay, as the wisdom of God requires in certain experiences. And I'll give examples over that. But when you're dealing with religion, it doesn't even want to hear that God can do certain things. Oh, you know, some people have given into the teaching of New Age, where you can ask for anything, whatever you ask. Listen, yes, the New Age movement, the teachings of this world and of darkness, have probably borrowed some patterns of scripture. But that doesn't mean that because they have borrowed certain things that are scriptural, because they're using some of those things to access certain things, it means that all the things that they have borrowed from scripture now become wrong because they borrowed them from scripture. But I see people say, oh no, this is new age teaching. No, not all people who teach blessing are new age teachers. I will probably teach from the new age teachings of darkness. No. No. It takes a certain wisdom for you to separate that. Otherwise, when you become religious constantly, you start disconnecting from the purposes of God. Romans 12 verse 1 says something, and if you will read in the Amplified Bible, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God. This is Paul pleading with believers, okay? And it says, make a decisive dedication, all right, of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. It says, as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual Worship. When God says he has called you to be a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, it means the altar he has created for the New Testament believer is to make the sacrifice live, not the sacrifice to die. Now, here he's talking about your body, right? You know, when you become born again, all right, it is the spirit man you become, all right? That man is born of God. Okay? And he cannot commit sin. That's the man of the spirit. All right? Peter says, born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. It liveth and abideth forever. That's the man of the spirit. All right? Your soul is converted from darkness to light. It's not changed. It has no change at all. Your body has no change at all. That is why our war is, of the spirit is with the flesh. For the flesh is an enmity to the spirit, and the spirit is an enmity to the flesh. If the spirit is alive, okay, because of Christ, and the soul is alive because of salvation, he's saying, I also want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. Our God is a God of living things. God has called us to be living sacrifices and not dead inspiration. He has not just called you to be the kind who is saying, oh, oh I live, I live. But yet the things in you are so dead. And that is the issue I have with the spirit of religion because they minister death on the altars of sacrifice, okay, in the dispensation where the altar must give life. 
The altar must give life. God does not call the New Testament believer to an altar of death in the sacrifice. No, he has called a New Testament believer through truth to design life in the sacrifice. In the sacrifice. It means the more you are given into the sacrifice of God is the more you live. The more you serve God is the more life you have. The more you live for God is the more provision you have. The more you give yourself to God is the more graces that are multiplying to give life to everything around you. Otherwise, our people of religion, when they kill men on the altars of sacrifice, they call that honorable. They call it honorable. They call it glorious. They call it righteous. They call it a great thing. Oh, see the things I've sacrificed. All right? They're the kind who come after 20 years, all right? And everything is broken. Their eyes are broken. The teeth are out. Everything, they're poor. The, everything is out. And then they say, I'm a believer. Behold a Christian. Listen, God has called us to live on our altars of sacrifices. God has put life where your sacrifice is. The Bible says somewhere in Proverbs 10 verses 3, He says, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to furnish he will not. He says, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. But when it comes to the soul of the righteous, the Bible says he will not suffer the soul of the righteous man to famish, to rot away, to waste away, for things to go out of line. Oh yes, I'm not saying that attacks don't come or testations don't come. But do you know who you are in these attacks? Do you know what God has called you to be in these attacks? Or do you accept everything as, ah, you know, it's the will of God for me to be this. It's the will of God for me to be sick. It's the will of God for me to be poor. You even take glory in poverty because you're a Christian. Or I met somebody one day and he said, you know, apostle, I would have been a very rich man. But I'm still poor because I refuse to be corrupt at my workplace. I said, what? What? How can you say that you are still poor because you refused to be corrupt at your workplace? I actually thought that God rewards righteousness. And because he rewards righteousness, the very reason he will make you rich. Oh yes, I had my years of working in the bank. I worked for six years. And I saw deals that went under tables. And yes, it's true. I could not compromise into those things. It's true. I've lived that life too. All right? But that didn't make me poor. No. On the contrary, there's a reward for men which are faithful. So you're not supposed to say, oh, you know, I'm poor because I refuse to take a bribe. Oh, you mean that all the people who are rich take bribes or are corrupt? No, there are people who are rich and are legitimate and are genuine. Oh, in this country, in that country, in my nation, in America, in Africa, in this place, if you're not corrupt, you cannot be rich. That's a lie. That's a lie of the devil. God can bless you. And will bless you. If you understand how it works. He has said the righteous will never be led to famish. But why is it that today we look at a Christianity that is so beaten. That people look at many Christians that they don't want to receive Jesus. Somebody proclaims over Christ and the things they are going through. is almost as though the Jesus they are talking about was not crucified. Because people don't understand. The God that answers desire. It's a powerful thing. Because when you get into those boundaries, you're talking about liberties. And men don't know how to live in the liberties of abundance, but yet still be under the control of the person of the Holy Spirit. But I will show you in a while. I'll show you in a while. God has not called you to be furnished. Oh, the man of God loved God. This believer loved God. See, he has nothing in his life. He has nothing in his life. Oh, why are you so rich? Eh? Eh? As a pastor, why do you have a Benz as a pastor? Why do you ride in a jet? Why as a pastor? Yet there are poor people. Hey, wait a minute. The people who are asking those questions too, if they got those jets, would they ride in them? Yes. So is it wrong for a Christian to be rich? It's not wrong for a Christian to be rich. Oh, prosperity gospel, because they think every man who is prosperous is corrupt in the spirit. No. Not every believer who is prosperous is corrupt in the spirit. I know men who are filthy rich, but they are feeding the widows. They are feeding the orphans. They are building schools and universities to educate nations. They are changing nations. He told us actually, you will lend to nations and not borrow. So if you have a problem with a Christian being rich, hello, Christians were called to lend to nations. 
And the days have come where nations will come and confess their debts before believers. And some of you are listening to me. And you'll bail them out to the glory of God. Because wealth does not change us. We don't disconnect from the responsibility of that wealth. Because a man can be mature enough to know that you can still be wealthy and be wealthy for the gospel, for the glory of God. The Bible says the Lord delights in the prosperity of his own. God has no problem with you being prosperous. He only has a problem if you don't understand the responsibility of that prosperity. It's not just finances. Christians are sick. They're famished. They look eaten. You look at an individual. They look malnourished. From spiritual into the physical, they're famished. And what does Isaiah say in chapter 5, verses 13 in the Amplified? He says, therefore... My people go into captivity to their enemies without knowing it. And because they have no knowledge of God, they have no knowledge of God. And because they have no knowledge of God, their honorable men, the glory of their honorable men, they are famished. Their honorable men are famished. The Bible says, and their common people are parched with thirst. So God is saying the reason why you see common people parched with thirst and then you see Honorable men famished and their glory is gone. It is because there is a certain knowledge of God people don't know. It is not because they are too pious. They are too God-fearing. They are too reverent and that is why they are suffering like that. No. Not all suffering is of God. Not all suffering is of God. And the grace of God does not disconnect itself if indeed the suffering is of God. It doesn't take away the reality of God's kingdom for as long as the person of the Holy Spirit still remains on the earth. God will still do miracles. He'll continue to do signs. He'll continue to do wonders. And not just of the healing of bodies, of the cleansing of the lepers and of the raising of the dead. In our finances, in our ministries, in our marriage, in every aspect of our lives. That is why he sent the Holy Spirit, the helper suitable. To teach us the way of God. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. But today Christians accept the worst kinds of things. Today actually the world thinks that believers are supposed to be the poorest people. Because they are believers. They are supposed to be the most disadvantaged. Because the world, Satan has deceived the world to think that that's piety. That's reverence. That's honorable. That's honorable. No. It's not how God has called us. Our father Abraham was filthy rich. But he did not set his heart on that wealth. David was wealthy. But he did not set his heart on that wealth. Solomon was wealthy. No, read the patriarchs. Paul says, I know how to be full. Jesus only became poor for your sake that you could become rich. But he was not a poor man. Now that is regardless of what, oh yeah, yeah, seasons, yeah, businesses are closed, I heard, you know, airports are closed, so what? Oh yes, we've not been working because of COVID season, so what? It does not take away the reality of God that whatsoever things ye desire. But I want to talk about the power to desire. The fact that God can actually take a man to the level of giving him all the man desires. What a powerful thought. What a powerful thought. Now, let me help us reconcile these liberties so you will know exactly how this works. All right? Now, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20, okay, is a common scripture, and I want to read it from the Amplified. All right? And this I want to read for people who are still struggling with the spirit of religion. Because it's a limiting spirit. In fact, religion is back to bondage. Back to the same place of bondage. Alright? When the Bible says, Now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power, that is at work within us, all right, is able to carry out his purpose and do superabundantly far over and above all that we dare to ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and dreams. Let me explain what this means. It means God can do 
and is able to do beyond the craziest demand you can ever set on him if you understand how he works. So those of them who are actually a problem, that Christians are rich or people are blessed or people are healthy, let me open your eyes to this. Ephesians says God is even able to do way more than you have seen in their lives and you're even judging. God is able to do exceedingly far beyond what is disturbing your head about the success of a man. He's able to do far, far, far above. And he says, and that working power is within us. We don't call it from heaven. It's within us. That means in you is everything you need. Why is it that believers are still struggling to get their desires answered? Why have you asked for a house for years? Why have you asked for a ministry for years? Why have you asked for a car for years? Why have you asked for marriage for years? Why have you asked for children? Why? You have not yet known God a certain way. And I want to help you. I want to help you connect to something. I want to take you to the place where our desires are met. It's possible. And God has indeed called you to live a very glorious life in Christ. He says, the devil cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Okay? The Amplified says, until it overflows full until it overflows, to have and enjoy. God has not called you to a life of suffering. He's called you to enjoy life and have it in abundance. Because our altars release life in the truth of the dispensation we're in. They don't release death. He has not called us to die on the altars of sacrifice. He has not called you to serve him for 30 years and then die poor, broke, beggarly, and sickly. He has not called you for that seen people who have given up in the faith. I've met men and women. I've had an opportunity and God has graced me. I so much connect with, you know, the lowest people in society. You know, because there's something that moves me when I see a struggling minister. Because I know what it's like to struggle in ministry. I know what it's like. I know a child who looked at their pastor, the father who was a pastor, and told her, Father, if your God cannot provide for us food like we have been living all this while, what's my point of following him? This was a child telling their father, and this was a man of God. How much pain gripped that man when he stands every Sunday and says, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. And your daughter walks to you and tells you, If your God cannot meet our meal, if he cannot provide us with food like we have been believing all these days, then what's my point of following your God? What's the point of following your God? They say to the man of God. He was broken. I sat one time with a man, a believer, who has walked with God for close to 40 years. He has served God for 40 years. He served God since he was little. He got married in the church. He did crusades in different places. He served God. And then one time he sat me down and told me, Apostle, one time my son, my child became sick and I went to hospital. And the doctor told me that to heal your child, you need 25,000 shillings. All right? Ugandan shillings. 25,000 Ugandan shillings. And he said, and I moved for two days looking for 25,000 Ugandan shillings. And I failed to get that money. And I went back to the doctor with 5,000 shillings. That's probably a dollar and four cents or three cents. It's all I had. The doctor told me, that's not enough to give the medication to your child. And he told me, Apostle, my child died. Because I could not raise 25,000 shillings. He could not raise it and lost the child. And he said, but I love God. I have served God all the days of my life, but my child died because I could not treat them for $15. What of the siblings of that child that were watching their own brother die because their father could not own 25,000 Ugandan shillings? That's a spirit. That's darkness. That's death. Or at least if the man could not afford, at least let him know the power that heals the sick and he can lay hands on that child and be healed. So I've seen it. 
firsthand I've had an opportunity to see families, to see households that are lacking, sickly, beggarly, so disadvantaged that you almost ask, where is their God? You even ask, how do they live this way with God? Without questioning things around them. How do they live without questioning? Probably many have even asked and failed to get answers. And they've gone to every kind of church, prophets, pastors, evangelists, they're laying hands overnight, counseling, they've done everything, they've done it all. But they failed to find an answer. And God said, your honorable men are famished, even in their glory, because they do not know God a certain way. They don't know God a certain way. That's what famishes us. I heard of a believer, a pastor, great pastor, who's all close to a general in this nation. And I was told in his death he could not even afford a meal. And I said, no, God has not called the righteous to be forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. He has not called us that way. I'm talking about money, but there are other aspects as well. He has not called us to suffer a certain way. And I know some people think it's honorable and glorious. Oh, I need the grace of God. As long as the grace of God abides, oh, they're quoting Paul because they don't understand what the Bible says when he says my grace is sufficient. They don't understand it. They think that you're supposed to tolerate sickness and disease and gestation until the day you die. No, no, God has not called you to suffering. He's called you to enjoy life and have it abundantly until it overflows. It's the will of God that the glory settles on your life and in every aspect of way. That means that attacks don't come, but it only means he has equipped you enough through his word to give you everything, everything that you need, because it's all available for you. He has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So why don't we see this? Why don't we see our desires even, why don't we receive whatsoever we desire? Like Mark eleven twenty four says, I'll show you. In Psalms chapter 37, verses 4, he says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. The fifth verse says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The Hebrew word there for delight thyself. Delight, because I'm giving you the key here. I'm giving you the catch, all right? I'm giving you the ultimate preposition. It says, delight yourself. Delight yourself in the Lord. And it says, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Now, the Hebrew word there is alnag. Right? And our nag means to be susceptible to being led or directed. That means you're broken enough to be led or directed by God. To be capable of being twisted and shaped and designed under all conditions without breaking. That's what he calls our nag. That's what it means to delight yourself in the Lord. One of the definitions is that. To be soft and flexible with God under all conditions. To be flexible with God. To be able to be broken or bent or killed in God. To be able to be inconvenienced in God. Some people are not flexible when it comes to the things of God. They are not susceptible to being led or directed. And how is it done? Simple. By cultivating a certain relationship with God and being available to his presence. Because every time you're cultivating a certain relationship and being available to the presence of God, there's a way he starts to break you. No man says, that, oh no, from today I'm going to start breaking myself. No, it's the man to say from today I'm going to avail myself to God for him to break. I'm going to avail myself for him to flex me, to bend me, to make me, you know, so soft before him that I'm susceptible to being led and directed by him. God wants you to give him your heart. My son, give me all your heart. He says, and I will reveal to you my ways. 
The ways of God are revealed to men who are so broken before God, who are so bent before God, and they are twisted and broken under all conditions. He says, in there is the perfection in his presence, in his glory, and in the seeking of this God that starts to align your heart. And as it aligns your heart, you start to realize you do not have desires independent of him, but rather your desires are of him. Okay? You don't desire out of lust and selfish thought, but you start to desire and dream because your desires are of him and you desire because he causes you to desire. When a man is in that liberty of the spirit, and I wish I can explain for somebody to understand, when that man desires even the most expensive car, he doesn't look at that car as a luxury. He doesn't show off. He looks at that car as a tool. He doesn't look at anything, even the most expensive things you will see. He will not look at those things as a luxury as a positional place to be exalted among many, or to feel like he needs to be worshipped because he has those things, or praised. But rather, they look like a nothingness of simply tools for the furtherance of the gospel. He doesn't boast in the same because they're not for him in the boasting. He's actually dead to those things. Yet those things are alive to him. I wish somebody understands what I'm saying. Some people are not susceptible to being led. They are not able to be twisted and bent under all conditions. Years ago, when I started to worship God, to serve God, a young man walked to me. He was a very blessed fellow. He was blessed at a very young age, very, very blessed in all aspects. I mean, his marriage was working right. You know, his ministry was, you know, thriving up in the air. He was a very wealthy fellow at a very young age. I remember he was doing quite a lot for his age. And I remember he met me. I was a couple of years younger than him, but we're great friends. Then he said, you know what? I see the way you love and serve God. And he said, one day God will bless you. He will prosper you in every aspect of life. Because my heart, he said to me, was broken years ago to the service of God, and I know what he does when you serve him right with the right heart. When that man spoke those words, I heard God speaking. And those words were an encouragement to me. They were not my leading and inspiration to do because I was already serving God even before those words came. And I was not serving God because of those words. But for me, they were a confirmation of affirmed experience that I already had in God that he is indeed the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. From my childhood, when I started to serve God, those who know me will tell you, my parents will tell you, my family or close friends will tell you, that I learned so early to be flexible, for God, flexible for God, susceptible to his leading and direction. Even when some of these leadings are out of human understanding. And up to today, I'm still the same man. I'm still the same person. I've not changed. None of the blessings God has put around me have changed me. I'm still the same man. I still love God like I first met him. And I still serve him. I still do things that men in our levels of anointings cannot do. And some think that they are more special because they've been elevated to certain spaces. No. On the contrary, they are dying because they don't know how God raised them up there. Now, if I make these statements to a man who is lasting, all right, to a man who is carnal, to a man who is not connected to God in a certain way, he will start to look at the service, okay? of God as a means to the end of the fulfillment of the desires. And then he'll go into the service, the commitments to God in the end to have his desires met. That's a lustful man. In fact, for men who are in the places where their desires are met, they are so dead to the means of serving for the desires to be met because it's not important, in fact, that their desires are met, but that they might be pleasing to God. I hope somebody understood that. So, for example, when you read the scripture, delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give thee all your heart's desires. For a man who is lustful and carnal, he will now start to delight in God, so his desires will be met. 
You understand? But yet the people for whom the desires are met, many of them are actually dead to their own desires because they are employing all their efforts to please God. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The stuff you're dead to leaves to you. And the stuff you live to dies to you. All right? When it comes to the things of this world, the more you start to seek certain things, the more they will go far from you because they become your God. All right? But the more you die from the seeking of certain things and pursue God, the more these things will come to you. But God is not saying that from today now start to pursue him because you want the other stuff. That means you're lusting. But rather he's saying, be so dead in me that that stuff is no longer important and it will start to come to you. But when it comes to you, it will come to you as a man who is so dead and twisted by me that you will not look at that stuff as a place of elevation and glory and praise, that you will not become king of kings and lord of lords because you have an extra amount of money on your account. But you'll still be dead to the God you please because you'll understand that I only live to please him and nothing else. You'll still be dead to the things of this world because your heart will be you know, aligned to God. But what am I trying to say? We are missing the bigger picture, that in fact, we're not supposed to be seeking after our desires. We are supposed to be available and delighted in the Lord. And to a point to the end where we will never desire. And when we stop to desire anything, like when the man of the Proverbs is talking about wisdom, he says wisdom is higher than anything you could ever desire for because you start to desire the things of God. And when you learn to desire the things of God, some of these things start to come to you. I cannot tell you how many things have been given me, all right, that I think will take some people 30 or 40 years or 50 years to have. And when those things come, they don't excite me. They don't move me. They don't change me because nothing in the world can take the place of the Holy Spirit and what he does in my soul when I sit alone in the room and just think on him and he's there some people are so alive to the world that they're not available to the presence to God and who he is you are not flexible when it comes to the things of God but yet you want to have the fullness of the things touching God he has to kill you enough for the stuff you desire to come because by that time you are dead, it's no longer your desires, it's his desires. And everything that comes to you now, no man, even though they will think or seek to judge, will be able to judge you. Like Paul says, for it is a small thing for any man to judge me, for I know nothing of myself. That's a man who knows, who has understood the highest places of our liberties of the spirit. But yet when you are in that place, desire is a simple thing because every time you desire, there's an intent of the wisdom and the heart of truth and purity of the wisdom of God in the desire that it will automatically come. And yes, some of the stuff will have, all right, the people of the world will seek for and they will think that that is the very reason why we sought God for. But yet when you are in that place where you are dead to the world but alive and to God and you choose to give your body, your life, your soul and everything that touches you to God for him to deal with you and only focus this one thing to seek and serve God, you realize the things that start to come your way are things you're not even able to count or you'll not even be able to record even though you'll see them coming because those are a blessing blessing extensively to the people that watch your life and the future and the nations that you must be able to preach to because of the success that comes with your life but yet you will be dead to those things i see young preachers who just buy little small cars and they become so proud and become so god that they are even unreachable you know young pastors who have just gotten something simple and from that day you can't answer people's calls you're unapproachable you're up there you dwell in places that men cannot reach and yet there are men who are way way more blessed than you are and are still down to earth and they still live normal lives and still breathe and relate with people and i tell people when wealth comes or any of these things of this world comes they should never change you they should never change you they should never change you there's only one thing that should ever be the fixed mark to change you, and that is the stuff that happens with you and God. Dead to the world, but alive unto God. Alive unto God. Recall yourselves dead to sin and, and alive unto God. If you ever wake up and you're worried about school fees, worried about rent, 
You worried about food. You worried about a car. You worried about a house. You worried about ministry. To the degree of your worry and concern is to the degree that you are disconnected from the knowledge of God. From the knowledge of God. There is something about the presence of God that satisfies. And God wants to take you to a certain level where you are so full, so infused, so consumed in Him that you'll never think another day for rent, for houses, for health, for any of that stuff. And when you are consumed in that realm, you'll start to realize that your desires are actually his desires and that everything you'll desire from then on will be him actually desiring because you are dead to the world but alive unto him. Your flesh, your body, your carnal senses are aligned totally, dead to the world and then aligned to the spirit man. When they are alive to the spirit man, even when money comes, it will not excite you, but it will be available. When doors open, they will not excite you, but they will be available. Because every door God will open to you will be a place of responsibility and accountability toward God. For whom much is given, much is required. God has no problem to give you much. He has a problem when you don't have the responsibility of the much that you're seeking for. And people are losing that picture. And what are they doing? They actually last them more. And you find a Christian going on prayer mountain. For four weeks, seeking for a child, seeking for a car, seeking for a house, seeking for a job, seeking for marriage. Because men have failed to come, you have lost the plot already. Go to the prayer mountain just to be with God. Set aside moments just to be with your God. I tell people, if your time in the presence of God can kill your consciousness and mind to the things you so need or desire in the world, then you are where God wants you to be. To give you all and beyond exceedingly that you could ever ask or think according to the working power that works in you. And so by the time you actually think to need a car, it comes in the provision and the graces of God. In fact, it sets a law in the spirit to make sure that it is all manifestedly possible for you to have that thing you desire. Because it's in the heart and mind of God. He sees the purpose. There is a purpose in the things that you pursue. God has not just called us to be irresponsible Christians who are simply asking for everything and anything because we have the law of liberty. Jesus was not a man who wasted because there was abundance. Even when he fed 5,000 people and 12 baskets, you know, were excess, he told them, keep it. He didn't say, throw it. Or besides, I can ask for anything, anytime for your provision. He was not a wester. And I tell believers, when you become wealthy, you stop wasting. Because there are people in the world who need the very stuff you waste. I've seen Christians throwing away food. They serve on the plates more than they need. That's gluttony. It's a spirit. You should not waste because the Lord has prospered you. You should not hoard and buy more than you need because you're prospered by God. No. It takes a certain wisdom. It means you're still are lasting somewhere. There's something in your flesh that has not yet died. You are still enslaved in your mentality. At one point in your life, you lacked. And so you serve more, you do more, you amass more because you think that that is satisfaction. Your satisfaction should be in him. I tell people if you have clothes on your body, food to eat, and an anointing, it's enough. There's a godliness that brings contentment. But yet in that godliness, everything you need is given because your desire is his desire. You're not set aside in desire from God. That is the liberty through which he says in Mark eleven twenty four, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So we look to the end of that process as the working of God in the man to receive all that is available for him. But some people, when they read that, they read that from a carnal mentality and they desire stuff they'll never have because they're so indifferent to the knowledge of God. And I pray by God, even as I've spoken these things, however complicated and many words have been mixed in this, that you will understand what I'm trying to say. When you understand it, you will not one day wake up to desire of a thing that you cannot have. I live in a place where there is nothing I desire that has not been given. The Bible says the Lord gave all that David desired. 
Oh, but he didn't give him the temple. No, no. How do you mean he did not give him the temple if his own seed built the temple? You could actually say God gave him the temple a certain way, but he still did give him the temple through his seed. Because he was a man after God's own heart. There can be changes in ways things come, but the exact stuff came in the lineage of David. God has not called you to be denied. And I'm talking about men who have understood God. I'm talking about the person who says, oh, whatsoever things I desire, I want that man. Yet the man is not yours. I want that woman. Yet that woman is not yours. You're still lost. You're still carnal. And I believe that's where folk who are religious look from to consider you know, the deadness in certain individuals to judge the liberties with which we have in Christ, that indeed all our desires can be met when we are aligned and susceptible to his leading and direction. So do not let religion judge you for the liberties of the things that God has availed for your access because someone cannot try to access the same and could abuse or has abused the same. No, we don't pay prices for other men's inefficiencies. Walk your course as one who knows what God has called you to be. And don't be sorry to be blessed by God because he intends to bless you and he will indeed bless you. It's a great time. It's a great season. And I see that even in this period of COVID and all this, oh yes, you know, businesses are closed, finances are out of line and stuff, but God still abides supreme and he has still positioned you and I for success. The question is, are you ready? question is, are you available to God? The question is, are you committed to be available for his work? When you see, when your eyes open to this, you realize that in the most dead spaces is the most clear voice of God telling us what to do. For when there's a casting down, he says, you shall say that there's a lifting up. And this is my time, this is my season as for you who is watching. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word that goes out tonight. The end of this conversation was simple. That again, even though we know that you will give us our heart's desires if we believe uh, to receive them, but you've showed us that this message is for men which are delighting in the Lord, men who are susceptible to his leading and direction, men who can be bent, flexed under all conditions for God because they have committed to be available to him. In the worst times, they are available to God. In the best times, they are available to God. Under attack, they're still serving God. Under testations, they're still serving God. Under sickness, they still served God. And he's saying, he knows your heart. He knows your heart. For the Bible says you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and water and he shall take sickness from the midst of thee. He is the God who knows how to bless his own. Serve God in the mighty name of Jesus and he will amaze you at the things that will come your way. By the time those things come, indeed, you'll be dead to them. That's a man who is committed and aligned to God's will and purposes. I thank you, Lord, because this word particularly has sat in a particular heart and somebody's going to start to see the hand of God like never before in your ministry, in your marriage, in your life, in your health, in everything, in your business, in your career, in your relationships, in your children, every aspect of you. Just seek and fix your eyes on God, the oath and the finish of your faith, and all the stuff will get aligned. May your heart or respond to know him. May you see seek. May you always hunger. May you thirst only to know God and nothing else. In Jesus my name we have prayed and believed. Amen. Miracles have happened. I am persuaded. I am excited and persuaded that great things have come for you in the mighty name of Jesus. And for those of you who have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity, an invitation to receive him. Not tomorrow, not next week. Now is the acceptable time. Now faith is, not next week. I want to give you an opportunity to receive the man who shed his blood for you and made all this possible. Not as one getting born again to be blessed, but as one getting born again because you had to give your life to Christ. There is more than just what we have in the earth. It is life eternal. And that's what God wants to give you today. So if you're there, I want you to repeat this other to me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word tonight. And I give you my heart. I give you my life. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. 
The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.